You've got a business idea, and it's going to change the world. And all you need to make it happen is funding. You've seen the TechCrunch articles, the million dollar rounds at million dollar valuations. If that company managed to raise money, why can't you? I'm going to explain everything I know about startup funding in this video from starting the company to series A, B, and all the alphabet series. We're a venture-backed company ourselves. We know how this works. Literally, what we do for a living is teach founders how to navigate this stuff. But there's a crucial thing that you have to understand first, which is whether or not your startup can raise money. Startups fall into one of two baskets. This basket is the explosive growth kind, the million dollar rounds, the crazy valuations, the tech crunch kind. Investors will pour money into this company because they are betting on that explosive growth. The way they recover all that money that they invest in is if A, another company buys this business, or B, if shares become public and are traded in the stock market, which I guess also means people acquire this business. And when the paycheck finally comes, some OG investors in a company can make 300 times their original investment. That is the venture capital game. But what about this other basket? Well, this business is not looking to be sold or to IPO. It's looking to just be a normal business and make money. Maybe the founders really like working for that company, being their own boss. Maybe they wanna inherit this business to their children. Maybe they don't wanna share control with anyone. They want that 51%. If you're in this basket, you're perfectly fine. But putting it simply, you can't raise money from investors in the other basket. You don't get to raise a million dollars for 15% of your company. It's a completely different deal. And I can make a video about how those companies get funded, but today we're not gonna focus on that kind. Today we're focusing on the explosive growth kind. So let's finally talk about funding now. The whole idea with this kind of company is that you want to reach that insane explosive growth milestone and then cash out. And doing this will cost you a lot of money. Fueling explosive growth means spending really aggressively for many years, actually spending more money than your company makes. Think of how much money Facebook burned before it made a profit, or Amazon. Everyone is betting on that long-term goal, and if it pays off, it pays off really well. But to get there quickly absolutely requires external capital. Now, of course, it'd be a lot easier to raise all this money up front, but nobody's willing to take such a big risk of funding all the money that this company will need up front, so you have to raise it in rounds. Pre-seed rounds are meant to build and launch products. Seed rounds are usually raised when the product is launched and when it's growing, and they're raised to make things move faster. Series A rounds are usually raised when the company has over a million dollars in annual revenue. Series B rounds are for companies in their $10 million revenue range. And as you approach investors, you wanna make sure that you focus on investors that fund businesses in your stage. If you're a pre-seed company, you should not waste time talking to seed investors because it's, it's a new move and you're really wasting your precious time. The requirements for the pitch deck also change because pre-seed decks are mostly about the team, the capacity, the team's capacity to build the product, Seed decks are much more about customer traction, about understanding your initial growth tactics and make sure, making sure that you can replicate them. Series A rounds and beyond are much more about proving a deep understanding of your growth numbers, proving that your financials are healthy, and as the rounds get bigger, understanding what an exit could look like for your business. We helped this company called Upkeep write their Series B deck uh, a couple years ago. The bulk of the work that we did was precisely around this, around understanding the metrics for the business and then focusing on which metrics would make for a good case on the pitch tech that would prove to investors that the company understood how to take over the market at that point, Series B. And they ended up raising at $36 million Series B, so the approach must have worked. And our video last week covers every single slide that we put on pitch decks and how to solve them, by the way, if you wanna check that out. Now, very crucially, as you go through these rounds, you're going to be diluted. Usually by Series B stage, founders will no longer own a controlling majority of the business. That means their total shares will represent less than 50% of the company. That does mean that somebody else gets to approve your salary raises. It means that the board can fire you if you don't do your job well. What? And the question for you is, well, do you wanna own 100% of a million dollar company? Or do you wanna own 20% of a $500 million business? I hate the term lifestyle business, but this is what the 100% of $1 million means. A business that helps you live comfortably being your own boss and make probably more money than you would do on a normal job. The other side is rough and painful and risky, and it's probably the only way to build billion dollar companies. Yes, you can probably find exceptions, but for the most part, 
that's the way it works. Your business is going to rely on investors for many years. And there are horror stories about founders being ousted by the board. There are solid companies that go out of business because they run out of money simply because they just couldn't agree on a valuation with investors and they just couldn't raise the next round of funding because they just depend on them. One of the most common reasons for this is getting stuck between rounds. So many companies die because they get stuck between one round and the other, and nobody really wants to pour money into a sinking ship. Pre-seed money should last you to seed. It should be enough to get you to seed stage and a few extra months to actually close the next round of funding. But if you finish your product and you aren't able to launch it, then you're in a bit of this catch-22 situation. Too early for a seed round, but too late to raise pre-seed money again. We actually got stuck between seed and series A and we have to scramble to survive. And well, that's a story for another day. This is where budgeting how much money you actually need and budgeting that accurately is crucial. And that's the CFO's job once you can afford one. And when before then, well, it's mostly your job as a founder. I had to learn how to do this myself and you know, hopefully for my next company, I don't make the same mistakes I already did, but I've built some pretty solid spreadsheets to help all the founders get started. It's a free download too, I'm gonna link it in the description. I've also put together a bootcamp to help founders master this stuff, the financial modeling, the forecasting, the formulas. It, it's a live, like very intensive spreadsheet geeking week. I'll also link that below. Now, your focus when you raise money, besides actually sealing the deal, should be about this runway, about understanding, about being absolutely 100% sure that the money that you're gonna raise will be enough to get the company to the next fundable milestone and not get stuck in the middle. But let's actually talk about the funding round now. What's the procedure to get investor money into the company? I have a little trivia for you. How do you give shares to investors? A, the company creates new shares for every new investor. B, the company reserves some shares to give to them. C, the founders sell part of their shares to investors, or D, the percentage ownership is redistributed every time. Let me explain this in the simplest terms I can. If Walt and Jesse get together to build, I don't know, a math lab, and they wanna split it equally, they'll each get, let's say, 10 shares, 50-50. Walt's shares will never change hands or be sold to investors, nor will Jesse's. If they ever decide to bring an investor to their startup, what'll happen is the company will create new shares for them. Walt will still have 10 shares, Jesse will still have 10 shares, and the new investors will get new shares in their name. And by doing that, the company's total shares will change. Walt's 10 shares will no longer be 50% of the total. So the percentages have changed, but not the shares that each one of them owns. So the answer to this question is A. For most companies around the world, issuing new shares, that's how things are gonna work. Especially for C-Corps in the US, which is the standard business type. Now, Answer D would be correct for LLCs, at least in the US. But LLCs are not a great practical type of business entity for multiple rounds of funding because you have to redistribute shares all the time and it's, it's a very complicated legal mess. Now, the question is, how many shares would an investor get? And for that, we need to talk about valuations. At its core, a startup valuation is like betting odds, agreeing on how much to risk and what reward to get if the investor is right. But a bunch of things come into play. In a startup, it's likely that more and more investors will come in the future, so the chunk of the pie left to founders needs to be enough to keep them motivated and working hard for years or decades to come. So let's use a story that we're all pretty familiar with, Facebook. Peter Thiel was Facebook's first investor, and he agreed to give Mark and Eduardo $500,000 in exchange for 10% of the company. So if $500,000, are 10% of the company, that means the entire company is worth $5 million. That's the post money valuation because it assumes the money is already part of the business. But that also means that before the money came in, the business was valued at four and a half million dollars. That was the pre-money valuation. So now let's think of that in bricks. Let's assume that Mark, Eduardo, and all the other guys who were part of Facebook had established the company with a total of 100 shares. Again, if the company is worth four and a half million dollars, then each share is worth $45,000. Peter Thiel's $500,000 investment would be enough to buy about 11 shares of this business, adding up to $495,000. So the company creates those shares and sells them to Peter. So we end up with 111 shares. Peter has 11 out of 111 shares, which is about 9.9%. For example, Eduardo's 30 shares, for example, have been diluted. They no longer represent 30% of the company. They are now 27% of the total. So after all of these rounds of funding, the number of shares that you start with as a founder probably hasn't changed. The difference is the company has issued a bunch of new shares for your investors and potentially for your employees. And that's what we call dilution. Same number of shares that represent a different percentage of the business. Now, 
If these valuation numbers seemed arbitrary, it's because they kind of are. There is no real way to put a value on a business that makes no money. There is no way to value an idea or a team. Some founders will go through this painful process of paying a company to do a valuation of their business plan and their forecast. But trust me, most of the time, that is pretty useless. At pre-seed stage, a valuation is usually just an agreement between the company and the investors on how much risk versus reward there's going to be. If you have a bunch of investors lined up and they're all looking to get a piece of the action, you can probably push for a better valuation. If you don't have a choice and there's only one investor interested, well, you don't really have a lot of bargaining power. Remember that we're in the explosive growth basket. All businesses in this basket are supposed to become huge unicorns, public companies. So your forecasts today aren't what makes the difference. They don't make you special. It's your ability to execute. Standard valuations for pre-seed companies these days are three to $5 million. Again, under the assumption that the company that you're working on is a $100 million or more company. At seed stage and on, it's a bit different. There is revenue now, or there should be. So investors can imagine a valuation based on a multiple of your growth maybe five or 10 times your annual revenue. Now, a quick disclaimer here is that having investors in your cap table, them owning shares in your business comes with um, complications, extra work. There's compliance reporting, there's board decisions. It also requires you to agree on a valuation in order to understand how many shares they're going to get. And one way to delay all those awkward and sometimes because of the lawyers, expensive conversations and honestly, to make your life easier is to use a convertible note. We made a whole video about how convertible notes work if you wanna check it out. Now, if you need help navigating this knot, this is exactly what we do. We have a plan that gives you access to monthly office hours with our team to clarify all these questions. And every new account kicks off with a one-on-one -on -one session with yours truly. I'm gonna link that in the description. See you guys in the next one.